the boy Blackbeard Mirage. I'm back with Sabin Salute. And um, hopefully everything been peaceful with the people out there. And what I want to do in this tape is, is we're going to talk about having an empire state of mind. Because I had a pretty profound spiritual experience the other day. And I'll go over it real quick, um, real briefly. But I woke up and I just went, you know, in the morning. I just was walking up the street and stuff like that. Um, just trying to have a natural meditation in the time of the morning. And as I was walking, I saw a turtle in the middle of the street. And when I saw the turtle, I, I felt a certain sensation or a certain jolt in my heart. And, you know, I immediately went over to the turtle and tried to get him out the road because, you know, it was ongoing, on, oncoming traffic. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to see him get hit or anything like that. So I immediately went over and, you know, tried to get him out the street and stuff like that. And um, long story, I was successful at it. You know, he, he got back to safety and I proceeded with my day. Now, what was very, very interesting about seeing that turtle in the street was is that just a few days prior to that, I had been reading about Turtle Island and Mount Meru and been having a lot of meditations on this, you know, trying to get more of a uh, connection basically just to the real truth of, of this planet. Uh, because, you know, as, as people say, if the trees could talk, you know, if these mountains could talk, if these valleys could talk, if the ocean could talk, we could get the real history on this stuff. So what I tend to do is, is I try to tap into, you know, the phenomenon that I know has been here since time immemorial. And I just connect my soul to that. So the soul of the ocean, the souls of the trees, you know what I'm saying? The soul of the sun in the sky, the soul to, of the wind, you know, just try to connect to that etheric part of um, everything that's part of the natural element um, environment because that's really what all the history is, is tied into and if you could consciously connect into that just by meditation um, just clearing your own mind and clearing yourself and just by being and being around it you know just it could be just something as simple as walking up and down the street but um, this is just some of the things that I tend to do and what it is is that you got to have an empire state of mind to ultimately free you know what I'm saying? This earth and free Malkuth because that's what has happened. The entire planet really has been colonized by parasitic thought. It's been par it's been um, colonized by parasitic beings. You know, people have colonized the natural resources, uh, colonized the minds of people, colonized the behaviors of people, colonized the economic situations of people. What we're really dealing with is a, a mad, a mad, you know, expansive um, colonial program. And we also dealing with a real, real bad food chain, too, because as they'll show you, you know, you may have, let's say, you know, the cow eating the grass. OK, but then you may have, let's say. The coyote coming to eat the cow, but then you may have. A snake, an anaconda come and then he'll eat the coyote. So what it is, is it's a form of a food chain. And what we got to remember is that there is a difference between a human being and the intellectual animal. See, really, a lot of us are just intellectual animals. Just because you come in a form of an arm, leg, leg, arm, head, that doesn't really make you a, hu a human being. A human being is what you read in Genesis. When, it, when the Elohim or God, the Most High, the, the spiritual, whatever you want to call it. But when that presence or when that phenomenon said, let me or let us create a man in our or my image. That was not only in physical appearance, but that was also in psychological and mental faculties. That was also in the way you emotionally respond to things. That was also in the way you behave. And it is also the way you express your personality and you express your own creative energy. And it is also the way you choose to use your own willpower and the way you make choices. So when we read in Genesis where the Most High says that I'm going to create man and woman in my image, that's not physically, okay? That's, that's in ways that are also not physical, all right? So indigenous people, when we were created in the image of the Elohim or the Most High, that was not only in appearance. Yes, we may have, you know, the, the, the copper color bronze complexion, you know what I'm saying? The gold skinned people. Yes, that is us. So that does reflect the, the cosmic etheric darkness that we do come through, but when it comes to the way we are as spiritual beings, you know what I'm saying? The way the heart chakra is, you know, the way that we choose to communicate, the way that we choose to use our intuition. That also is being in the image of the most highest will. OK, because let's just say, for example, you know, when I saw that turtle in the street, you know, I, I felt connected to that turtle. I didn't want to see the turtle get hit. 
Um, I just didn't want to see that. It was like I felt a part of myself with that turtle, basically. I had a certain interest. I was invested in that turtle. You know, so that's what made me play my part. So, what it is, man, is like niggas got to get serious about trying to see nature free. You know, and trying to really end the colonialism, basically, is what I'm what I'm talking about. Any form of colonialism, it must be ended. Um, real briefly, I don't have a, di a, a dictionary in front of me, but if we're going to define what colonialism is for this tape, colonialism is basically just the entrapment or the imprisoning, basically, of anything. You know what I'm saying? When you want to just try to confine something or want to box something in or want to try to prevent any kind of natural expression, that's colonialism, okay? So what we got to do is, is, as real men, you know, the real niggas is real niggas, we got to practice what's known as reverse colonialism. Let me repeat. As real niggas or as real men, we got to practice what's known as reverse colonialism, okay? Because the colonizer usually is going to be led by an emperor, all right? So the one who colonizes and the one who frees from the colonialization is going to be an emperor, okay? So we don't really want to think as lords. We don't even want to think as kings. We want to see ourselves as emperors, okay? Because cities are ran by mayors, okay? States are ran by, of course, you go your senators or whatever. Because a state really is just a form of a little kingdom, all right? But the one who rules over all the kingdoms or all the states will be viewed as more of the emperor or in this term, we would say the so-called president. So that's how that goes. You know how the federal government rules over and even kind of, you know, forces they will upon the states and how through I want to say it's the 19th and 11th Amendment. It may give, quote unquote, individual corporate states rights, but the federal government still come will come and force they will upon them. So these states are really just kingdoms within this whole empire known as the United States. OK, or we'll say the United States Empire and the president will be playing the role of the um, emperor. So we got to think as the, the emperor because the because a god is that's what an emperor is. OK, and by us being aboriginal men and real nagas, we are gods, but on the little G, you know, we're not the big G now. All right. We're gods as far as a little G. Because the, the real big emperor is the most high. That's, you know, what's, what's over everything. So we represent being emperors on this earth because the most high is not in a physical form here. The greatest incarnation of the most high as a physical form in the, in the vessel of a human being, it's going to be as an aboriginal man. You better believe that. So that's what we got to play out. We are little G's up under the big G. And we got to report to the big G, Okay. So that's how that works. So we got to have an empire state of mind. And that's going to be very, very necessary in order to free this planet from the um, the dark wizardry that the Talmudic, Babylonian, and whoever else is included with these people. Um, the dark, you know, spells that they've put on this planet through their colonialism. And even and when I say the dark Babylonian Talmudic, that even goes into, you know, the indigenous people who who sold and gave their birthright up before it was even any pale people here so once again now we're talking about a, a more of a domestic problem amongst indigenous people I ain't talking about no foreigner right now all right so what i'm gonna do real quick is um i'm gonna take y'all into my childhood when blackbeard was little there was a video game i was very very close to and that was mortal Kombat. <clears throat> you know i grew up in the 90s so the first um powerful gifts I can remember getting when I was little was a pair of number five Michael Jordans they were white red and orange they was like the fire red number five Air Jordans they was like in the early 90s I remember getting them and I remember getting uh, the Sega Genesis and we had Sonic the Hedgehog and we had Mortal Kombat me and my brother so this was something very very powerful that you know just was a good experience from my childhood I remember and at that time I remember you know, getting at the top of the ladder on the video game was the goal. And you fight, you know, Shao Kahn. And something about Shao Kahn was already, it, it, see, he stood out to me. You know what I'm saying? He was an intimidating type of force. And basically, he played the role as the emperor. All right. Now, if you've ever seen the movie, the movie Mortal Kombat, uh, in particular, Mortal Kombat 2, Annihilation, 
you know, in the beginning of the movie, there's a scene where, you know, all the people on the planet, but then, you know, there's a dark quantum wormhole that opens up basically in disguise that's playing Doth. And you see these foreign beings coming in from the outworld and they being led by this emperor named Shao Kahn. So it's ultimately these extraterrestrials. And what he's coming to do is, is you know, in the movie, of course, they're going to make him seem like a bad guy and taking over and all that. But but it's what I'm saying. It's, it's playing the role of the emperor because the emperor, he has two polarities. He can use his God force or his energy to conquer something. And when he conquers it, he can either liberate or he can colonize. Because when you conquer something, that basically just means that you have exerted your will upon it. And now you have a choice or a decision of what you want to do with it. And you can either choose to enslave it or you could choose to free it. So just because somebody's an emperor or a conqueror, it doesn't make them a bad person. Uh, what could possibly make them a bad person is what they choose to do with their God force once they have actually conquered. If they become very, very egotistical and very, very Yakubian, then they will do what Samuel um, explained when I read about Samuel 8 the other day. And when, you know, the Most High was basically telling Samuel that, you know, when these people call for a king and they want this human to lead and rule over them, then eventually he's just going to colonize them. He's going to take all their resources. He's going to force them to work and basically just rule and do, do stuff for him. So, you know, like I said, you can be an emperor, but are you going to liberate or are you going to colonize? You know what I'm saying? Are you going to free the souls of people? Are you going to try to help free the souls of people? Or are you going to try to assist and colonize in the souls of people? You know, are you trying to economically free yourself? Or are you trying to economically colonize yourself by keep working for these foreign corporations and governments and never trying to do nothing to, you know, uh, um, invest in yourself, you know, invest in people that look like you and that want to, you know, help people like you. Um, and then you grow something amongst yourself, you know. So we all are playing a role into, into this whole co colonial um, fuckery and shittery that's going on right now. We either are trying to liberate or we really are just trying to play into the, co the colonialism. So right now we deal with Shell Khan for more of the aspect of the reverse colonizer. You know, trying to come and free Turtle Island. Once again, like I saw that turtle in the street, I was trying to free Turtle Island. You see the occult message and the esoteric and what's going on? It was a turtle in the street who possibly could have got ran over by a car and killed. So that could have represented colonizing or subjugating the spiritual energy subjugating nature subjugating Malkuth subjugating the people you know but then Mirage came the Christ Heru Shao Kahn the emperor you know and I freed or I liberated Turtle Island or I freed or I liberated the turtle you know and pulled him out the street and, and put him in safety so basically I played my part in trying to liberate or you know free some shit okay trying to do reverse colonialism and that's some powerful shit because I'm just not thinking about it. Because, see, y'all got to remember, when I make these tapes, I, a lot of times, you know, um, I don't really be planning what I'm going to say. You know, it just kind of naturally come out. But me just not saying that and really thinking about it naturally through this tape, that's what the real message also was with that turtle. You know, me playing my part in trying to free Turtle Island by literally pulling a turtle out of the street when there's cars that could possibly run them over. You can't make this shit up, y'all. So what I'm going to do um, is, is I'm going to read about Shao Kahn. And then I'm going to go over a few things. And then we'll wrap it up with some pictures, all right? Because Shao Kahn is very important now because a lot of his stuff in Mortal Kombat, as far as a lot of the artwork and a lot of the little stories. See, once again, now, y'all remember now, Black Bear, yeah, he a gangster. But Black Bear be on his nerd shit, too, now. So I be into the whole comic books and like the, the 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 Dragon Ball Z and it's like you know I be reading like the little background stories and you know what I'm saying the little books that come with that shit like I, I kind of be into that stuff a lot so you know with Shao Kahn it's like an actual story behind him so we are gonna look at a picture and then I want we gonna like you know decipher things of, of Shao Kahn's story so real briefly um this is just real quick Wikipedia information. But Shao Kahn is a video game announcer introduced in Mortal Kombat 2 and is a reoccurring character of the video game series and extended franchise. Shao Kahn is depicted as a brutal warlord who is the emperor of the mystical realm Outworld. 
So what we want to pay attention to is, is once again, we as Aboriginal men are emperors of the outworld, all right? And then he was feared for godlike strength and knowledge of magic. Right here, they're going to put black magic. But once again, it may be an emperor who ain't using black magic. He may be liberating the people. Um, and then he seeks to conquer all the realms of Mortal Kombat universe and merge them with the outworld. So once again, you got the reversal. You could be a conqueror by trying to liberate or subjugate. Now, before I just go on, um, something else that's funny about Shell Khan is just how how he taunts people and shit in the video game. Like, you know, a motherfucker get their jaw knocked out and shit, and he'll just say, "You weak, pathetic fool," or, you know, "You imbecile," or, "Did you think you could win?" Or, I, I mean, that shit used to just be so funny to me as a kid. Just hearing him say that shit, you know, as niggas was just getting they fucking, just getting fucked up, you know. But, but anyway. So, let's just go into a few things. So, once again, the um, symbol, of course, Turtle Island. Um, that being a, an Aboriginal symbol. Um, and this is about freeing the heart. You know, it's, it's, it's really about freeing heart energy. Uh, freeing the heart energy and being very, very, you know, wise about how we deal with the heart energy of ourselves and other people. Um, also, real quick, I want to talk about the black and gold of Heru. Or what you see in front of you, of course, um the symbol of Heru. The black represents ultimately just a primordial matter, also known as Krishna, okay? Because as us being indigenous people, we gotta remember that a lot of the Aboriginal Americans, um, a lot of our close relatives are the people of the Pacific. Uh like the Polynesians, the Indonesians, basically those people of like South Asia, those people of Mu and Lemuria, um, the Pacific Island. Believe it or not, a lot of those copper colored people are, are more of our direct um, relatives and ancestors than even some of those Africans. So let me repeat that one more time. Us Aboriginal Americans, people that they call themselves Negroes, Blacks, African Americans. The people in the Pacific Islands, uh, once again, the Indonesian, the Polynesian, you know, this is Southern Pacific Islanders. Um, just like when they say Asiatics, you know, Pacific Islanders and stuff like that. Um, these people are, you know, we have a relation with those people, even probably a little more closer than some of these people we call in Africans. All right. Because go look up some of those pictures of those Pacific Islanders. And once again, these people in South Asia and they look like so-called Negroes. Okay. So Shao Khan is, that's the archetype he represents because the picture I'm going to show you, you're going to see that he's copper colored. And when you see the pyramids in the background, you're going to notice that they have this Asiatic Oriental type of um, construction or look to it. But it's in the same pyramid form that you're going to see in so-called Africa and the Americas. All right. So a lot of the, um, the connection to, you know, the indigenous Americans can be found in, you know, South, the South Asian um, area and those indigenous people over there. All right. Um. So once again, that's kind of why I brought up the um, Krishna, Harry Krishna, because that's the black and gold one. Because uh, you'll see Krishna, he's he's black sometimes. And of course, he's in India, you know. So what we're going to do right now is um, we're going to look at the picture real quick. So here we have real quick. Um a picture of Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat. Now what we're going to do before I get into the background of what's going on in the picture and stuff. Once again, you can see the pyramids right here. Okay. You see Shao Kahn's army from the outworld. The, all the other aboriginal indigenous men. The, the, you know, the army of the emperor. But once again, I want you to pay attention to, to these step pyramids. Alright. You see the step pyramids right here. You know, we got one right here. Step pyramid right here. But you see it look kind of kind of oriental or Asiatic, we're going to say. All right. Showing the connection. All right. Got another small one right here. Okay. Got another step pyramid back here. All right. So when they say that that Shao Kahn want to merge the out world with, work, with this world, that could also mean wanting to bring back the old and clean off and, and eradicate 
you know what I'm saying, and destroy the, the colonial shit that was put on top of the old world, all right? So is it the out world or is he from the old world? All right, let me repeat that. Is Shao Kahn from the out world or is he from the old world? All right, so what are they really talking about in Mortal Kombat? All right, this feared emperor. So let's look at Shao Kahn real quick. So first of all, I want you to look at the complexion of him. He's copper colored, just like we are. I don't know how that's going to show up on the moot on the screen. But just check Shao Kahn out now. Let's look at his hand. Listen, you see his hand. You see his arm. You know what I'm saying? And right now, let's pay attention to like his uh, chest area. Because you can kind of see more of his skin right there. And he has a mask on, but you can see his chin. Don't he look copper colored to you? So if Shao Kahn is coming from the outworld and he's an emperor from the outworld, why does he look like the indigenous people of this world? And why, do, why does his army look like that? But you see his eyes are glowing red, right? So that's showing you that he has a certain type of power. Okay? So this is showing that the indigenous man, the, the indigenous man, is something inside of us that we can unlock, you know? Because as they say, they say Shao Kahn had a certain type of power. A supernatural power and they're gonna call it being a witch or all them other you know derogatory terms but that's what it is also I want you to pay attention to his uh, crown right here don't you see the two horns now what do these two horns remind you of don't they remind you of the Baphomet or the two horns of Saturn or the two horns of Capricorn which deals with wisdom okay Capricorn also dealing with the darkness or the underworld all right also, the horns of Moses when he came down from the mountaintop receiving the word, the holy word. So as you can see right here, he has the Baphomet horns showing you the power. Then it's showing in his glowing red eyes too. Then he has the face of death because his skull, his crown is in the form of a skull. So once again, it's showing you he's a, more of a Diothian type figure. Okay. Because once again, not everybody that's on the planet right now is Aboriginal men. You know. Some of us have more of a dark way of doing things. Like, I'm one of those people. <laughs> you see? I have more of a dark way of, of, of how I exert my will. You know? So some people may, you know, take, let's say, of a Malcolm X approach and the Malcolm, you know, and the Martin Luther King approach. Uh, Shell Khan will be like the extreme of the Malcolm X approach. You know, let's say more of the dark energy. You know, and then you have Martin Luther King using more of a light energy or more of a uh, attraction type energy. You know, so once again, it don't make it seem like one is good and one is bad, but they just have different ways of doing things. So we're just, you know, looking at a picture, um, once again, of the Emperor Shao Kahn. You know, step pyramids. You know what I'm saying? But you see the chaos, fire and brimstone. So you know how they say Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by the fire and brimstone. You see that, right? But who you see leading the charge? The copper colored emperor. So once again, y'all, this this is, you know, this is who we dealing with. And then over here in the corner, you see the motherfucker who got hit with the whoopsie. You know, all my niggas out there that know more to combat. You see this person right here in the corner. Looks like he got his head chopped off and it's a fucking um, an arrow through his eye. But he got hit with the whoopsie. But yeah, my, but it's my nigga Shell Khan right here. You know, we're more the combat shit. And real quick, what we're gonna do now is look at another picture. So, so first now, we're gonna look at this, and we're gonna go back. So here we have now these years. You know, these years are off. Okay, these these pyramids were built. You know, more around like um, thirty thousand, fifty thousand, eighty thousand BC and stuff like that. Okay, so don't don't pay attention to these years. But what I want you to look at is the construction of how these these temples are made or these mountains, how they're made. And then we're going to go back to the Shell Khan one, okay? So here we have right here in South, Central and South America and Mexico, the Stair Pyramids of the Yucatan, all right? We're familiar with that. So that's what we got right here. And you see right here at the top, these three windows, that's what these little windows are right here. So y'all, this is like a more of like a room up here at the top okay so it's something going on up here it's not you know this is where all the action is taking place up here and that's what this is showing you the windows down here so that's right here in mexico 
Then we're going right here over to Egypt. Okay. Once again, these are just cities of ancient Atlantis. All right. Cities of ancient Atlantis. And you have another step pyramid right here in Egypt. All right. Once again, you see the same um, three windows right here. But on this pyramid, uh, I'm not sure if these three windows are at the top of this construction. All right. But, you know, you still see the, th the three pyramid, the uh, three windows. Excuse me. And then we have right here in Indonesia. OK, so once again, remember, I was telling you all about the Pacific um, connection. OK, or the Lemuria and the Mu connection to the indigenous Americans. All right. And how a lot of those, you know, are, are our folks. OK, that's why when you look at a lot of their pictures. They, they look just like us. But have uh, here you have right here in Indonesia, a step pyramid. All right. So you have Mexico, Indonesia and, and Egypt, and they all have step pyramids that all, you know, basically have some of the same construction. So they show you that these were all the same people. It was just in different parts of the planet. So when you think of Indonesia, think of this being a city of Atlantis. When you think of Egypt, think of this being a city of Atlantis. When you think of Mexico, think of this being a city of Atlantis. We're going to go over this again. When you think of Mexico, think of this being a city of Atlantis. When you think of Egypt, think of this being a city of Atlantis. When you think of Indonesia, think of this being a city of Atlantis. Okay. Now we're going to put this in more of the kingdom and the empire perspective. All right. Because an empire rules over a multiplicity of kingdoms. Okay. So Indonesia will be a kingdom of Atlantis because Atlantis is the empire. That's the world. So Indonesia will be a kingdom of Atlantis. Egypt would be a kingdom of Atlantis. Mexico would be a kingdom of Atlantis. All right. So once again, the emperor is he who, you know, frees or subjugates all of this. Okay. The emperor is he who frees or subjugates all of this. All right. So we're going to pay attention right here to this Indonesian one. All right. You see this Indonesian step pyramid. Okay. So once again, we are connected to multiple and all continents, y'all. So, yeah, we Aboriginal Americans because we from the city or the kingdom of America. But the empire we come from. We got relatives, you know, on, from other kingdoms. So Shao Kahn represents the emperor that, that, that comes to rule over all that. Now you see this um, step pyramid right here in Indonesia. Now I'm going to take you back to Shao Kahn. And that brings me back to this one right here. And you see this pyramid. Okay. So once again, they put it in Mortal Kombat. They put it right in our face. All right. Blackbeard has been knowing this as a kid. And now I understand why Shao Kahn stood out so much to me. Because he was a dark, you know what I'm saying, emperor from the old world. Or what we would call the underworld. Alright, so it's Shao Kahn from the old world or the underworld. Alright. Because once again, indigenous people, we from the old world. We're not from the new world. You know, we're from what they call the ancient world. Like they call our ancestors ancient. They don't call nobody else's ancestors ancient. Okay. So once again, Shao Kahn would be an ancient ancestor. Now, yes, he's a mythological character in the video game, but I'm saying on more of an we can say um archetypal symbolic. Just like how you all would have Abraham. There was no real man named Abraham that was a forefather. That's an archetype. Of real aboriginal men who are our real forefathers. So once again, Shao Kahn is the same thing. He's just an archetype. You know. But clearly he's an archetype for us because he's in his copper colored um indigenous appearance. So now I understand why he came back to the earth and he was pissed off. Cause look at how the planet is and the shit that Aboriginal people are going through. Aren't we colonized and being subjugated? So if an ancestor came back, what make y'all think that they would be like this? pale white Jesus acting all nice giving out bouquets of flour and all that with all this fuckery and, and shittery that's been going on on the planet why would any ancestor be coming back nice no they gonna come back on some shell con shit okay they gonna come back just like this they gonna come back with a fucking devastating army 
they're going to come back and they're going to erect pyramids again. And they're going to come back and they're going to be slaughtering and killing up a bunch of people. Why y'all think in Apocalypse with X-Men, didn't when he come back, didn't he build a pyramid? Wasn't that one of the first things he did when he came? You know? So once again, Shao Kahn, this is who that is. All right? And that's who that is. So to wrap this thing up, um, what we're going to talk about is, is that, you know, indigenous men will have to go on the Odyssey journey. All right. Now, what is the Odyssey journey? The Odyssey is a movie that came out that was based on a ancient mythology that our ancestors wrote. And the Odyssey ultimately is a story that deals with um, Odysseus. OK, and Odysseus is the king of Ithaca. All right. Once again, that king little gods or gods empires emperors once again so this is is a king and there is a war which which ends up being the trojan war i think and he has to get ready to go off on the um, to the war and he has to leave his kingdom for a temporary time because there are outside threats and there are just certain things that need to be addressed and done so what happens is is that odysseus his mother i mean his woman you know, she's crying and stuff. She doesn't want him to go. And at the same time, he just had a little boy or a baby. But part of the emperor or the king's journey or the God, the little guy's journey, God as in little G, because that's what we are. Part of the journey is, is that you have to leave your woman. And you have to leave your unborn or your, your, you know, freshly born child to go on the journey. OK, so what is that really saying? What that says is that, you know, in order to really be an emperor, you got to make decisions that emotionally may not always feel good. And you're going to have to make decisions that because you can see in the future and you can see on the long run what's going to be the result. And it will be beneficial for everybody that even if people don't understand your decision right now, you still going to make it and allow them to suffer and cry in the meantime. So in the future, they could get the glory because that's ultimately what happened in the movie Odysseus or in the mythology of Odysseus. You know, his woman did not want him to leave. So she was crying and, you know, she wanted him to stay in all this different stuff. And a lot of men out there don't really ever become God or don't ever become the emperor because they always stop because of their crying woman or the fear of them not being able to be around their kid. And what they don't realize is, is that this causes the woman to actually lose respect for the man. Because all men that attract, you know, women of high quality, they are attracted to your energy and the attributes that you possess through your personality. And these attributes also are what you use to conquer and keep things in order. So if, if there's a threat to your, your civilization and you got to go to war, that means that something is threatening the peace and threatening the order. So those same traits that you have that she was attracted to, now you have to use those to go to war. And actually keep things consistent, which is the peace and order. So when you're a woman or when women in general see men give up what needs to um, actually have the attention, they actually give up on what they were once attracted to in you. Because that same fearlessness that you had, that same, you know, um, entrepreneurial mentality that you had, that same God mentality that you had, when she see you scared to go to war, when she see you scared to go on the journey, when she see you scared to go on the Odyssey, she feel like that maybe you don't really have that trait that she once thought you had. So they lose confidence in you. So when you men out there say, OK, baby, I ain't going to go on my journey or OK, baby, I ain't going to you know, try to start my business and I'm going to keep my job just to make you happy. I ain't going to take no risk just to keep you happy. You think you're making your woman satisfied, but you're really not. And she actually losing respect for you by you doing that. So having an emperor state of mind is not easy. You know, you're going to make a lot of people feel a little, a little, you know, uneasy about some stuff. But in the long run, they will succeed. And that brings me to uh, a Machiavellian quote, you know, and it's that's why, you know, for you all out there that read my book, um, you probably saw, you know, some quotes that I put in there by him. But but one that 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 is a Machiavellian quote is, is that the end justifies the means. The end justifies the means. So if your kid got to cry right now. Or your girl got to cry right now because they're going to have success in the future. Then they got to cry right now. And you got to be willing to allow them to. And this also goes for you men out there that got these 